And now, ladies and gentlemen, please fasten your seatbelts. Welcome to PreneurCast. You know, business cards being swapped, beers being drunk. Can I say a nasty word? Can I say procrastination? With Pete Williams and Don Gosher. How well did that go down? We talk about that entire thing in a very another rant and soapbox episode if you want to. Visit us online at PreneurMarketing.com. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's show. It's uh, Dom Goucher here with Pete Williams. Hello, hello. Hello, sir. Great to have you back again. It's good to be back. It's been a crazy couple of weeks, but uh, I think we're on top of it all now and back in the usual routines, which is uh, which is exciting. Indeed, lots of change for both of us. So, uh, yep, we're catching up, catching up. This week, folks, on this week's show, uh, Pete talks to uh, Mark McDonald of Appster about the business of app development. Now, uh, we'll go back to that in a minute, but uh, what has been going on, Pete? What's been happening? Oh, mate, lots of stuff. It's, it's been interesting in, in, the, in the world of the, uh, the telco group, sort of, uh, you know, when someone goes off sick and when someone quits and when people have holidays and that all kind of happens in the same two-week period unexpectedly, uh, it causes a little bit of chaos. So, you know, no one's immune to that sort of stuff. It's been an interesting uh, calamity of events recently. Yeah. Uh, someone sort of went on a, 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 must, a much needed holiday, um, sort of a 10 day sort of trip, which was uh, not planned. Then we had a receptionist quit, and we had our service manager get rushed to hospital and be off for two weeks. Ooh. So, had sort of, you know, two or three very key positions kind of uh, all collapse at once, which has made it a bit crazy. And so, I've been spending a little bit more time than usual uh, in the telco kind of uh, helping out and uh, doing that sort of stuff. So, it's uh, it's been fun. It's been interesting kind of, you know, getting back on the ground level a little bit, which is uh, always nice to do. But uh, I think everything gets back to normal on Monday, which is uh, which is exciting. Cool, but you have been managing to kind of tick along in the background with with some of the printer stuff, haven't you? Yeah, had a couple of new essays go up on the blog this week, as uh, I think a lot of people uh, are noticing. We're putting a lot more effort uh, into the blog this year, and some really in depth, uh, evidence based essays with you know full of data and, and research and stuff. And two new ones this week to check out. So if you haven't been across to preneurmarketing dot com, make sure you do. We've got an essay on the four powerful strategies that dramatically reduce website visitor abandonment. And one of the, the crazy stats is that um, was it 67.89% of shopping carts are abandoned, which is huge. So that's a huge amount of people who sort of add something to a shopping cart on an e-commerce site or kind of, you know, click the, the buy now button but don't actually fill out their credit card details. And, you know, we kind of cover four different strategies that are going to help reduce that number. And obviously, at the end of the day, increase the conversions your business have. So it ties into the seven levers beautifully there. And then another cool. essay that went up this week was all about contests and sweepstakes. Um, it's uh, interesting to sort of see how these things can actually drive opt-ins and conversions. So we kind of share four different tips that can help you um, you know, grow your audience, grow your community, grow your clients by using contests and sweepstakes, which is pretty cool. 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 Um, well, on my side of the fence, uh, more of the growing of the uh, the offline business, as it were. Um, interesting uh, aside to that, just because we're scaling and we're scaling quite fast, there's a lot of things to handle, a lot of like, plates to spin, balls in the air, whatever metaphor you want to use. So we are leaning back heavily on Asana, our mm. favorite go-to project management tool. Um, folks, if you haven't looked at that, do do check it out. You know, for the basic small scale team, it's actually a free tool, and incredibly powerful. Pete and I have been using it for a while, and it's really been a godsend in this new setup that I've got going on. Um, and the other thing, just a shout out, and I think this is really important. This is a shout out. You may have seen on Twitter. I've already done this, but Orphonic link in the show notes, folks. I won't try and spell it for you, but Orphonic, which is an awesome, awesome tool, an online audio tool. Uh, that we put every single podcast through, uh, and it just it, it's what makes us sound so good. Let's be blunt about it. Uh-huh. Um, they've been running there for two years, um, so almost as long as our podcast has been going. Actually, Pete, hmm. um, they've been running for two years. They've recently just celebrated a two-year kind of birthday of, of creation and whatever. But uh, just start making a shout out to those guys because they really do make a huge difference. Not just to the sound of the show, but it's actually a kind of a workflow tool. I won't go into too much detail right now. You know, maybe I'll maybe I'll do something for the 
for the blog or something, you know, one of these index yeah. articles about our workflow for that. That'd be awesome. Um, but it makes a huge difference to the production of a podcast or, you know, putting things up on SoundCloud or wherever. So, um, well done, guys. Thanks a lot for all your help. Uh, and I'll put a link in the show notes. So uh, if you're into podcasting or thinking of getting into it, definitely check those guys out. Ah, very cool. Absolutely. So how's your reading been going, Pete? Because you've been a bit wobbly with that due to the lack of exercise and things the last few weeks. Well, uh, the exciting thing is, as I open up my iPhone, you can probably hear the clicks. I have officially finished uh, uh, the Schwarzenegger autobiography, which is nice. So that 24- or 30-hour epic has been completed, which is cool. And uh, on to two uh, new books. deserves a fanfare, that does, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, it was awesome. I was like, hey! It was like, you know, on my mm. iPad running around the other day, and the, the book finished, and I got sort of some music tracks that I kind of have on the iPad as well, or sorry, the iPod. Uh, and it was like, hey, you know, it was like almost victory sound that I finished the book. But mm. uh, on to some new stuff now. So two new books have been loaded up. Um, that I have, or was suggested by Tim Ferriss. Uh, some of them probably publicly, I think. The Art of Learning, I think, is his book of the month. He's starting a bit of a book club. So The Art of Learning, uh, which he's made public, is one book that I downloaded. And also another one called Daily Rituals, How Artists Work. And it kind of uh, talks about um, different artists and what they did to sort of, you know, create their craft. And it's interesting to sort of see what habits these, these old um, and new and current and everybody in this sort of artistic space are doing. And it's a really cool book. So Daily Habit, sorry, Daily Rituals and The Art of Learning are the two latest books that I've downloaded from Audible. Cool. I, I, I can speak for The, the Art of Learning because, uh, folks, you may have heard me talk about that in the past. Uh, I read it possibly almost probably a year or so ago. Awesome, awesome book. Really fascinating insight into um, two different worlds, actually. Um, one is as the art of learning, learning any particular skill, but also the, the guy who wrote it, Josh Waitzkin, um, was a chess master. And it's fascinating insight into that world, which I had no knowledge about whatsoever. Well, he's the um, uh, the the real life guy that I think the movie Searching for Bobby Fisher was about. Is that correct? That's that is correct. There we go. That is correct. So uh, yeah, I'm, I I I think you're going to enjoy that. And uh, you know, when you when you've gone through that, maybe we'll talk about it a bit more, Pete. Awesome. Sounds like a good plan. Cool. So on to the main main part of the show now, which is a conversation you had a a while ago with a chap called Mark McDonald of appster now what i like about this is you know this guy is really is running a business developing um you know smartphone android iphone ipad apps for other businesses right yeah so it's one of the probably the biggest it's not if it's not the biggest it's at least in the top two or three of app development companies yeah, in australia so they've uh growing a very successful business building apps. So it's almost like two conversations in one today. We sort of cover off a lot about, you know, if you're wanting to build an app, what's the process, you know, how can you get VC, how do you pitch, how does that whole world of app development work, uh, as well as we cover a bit about how he grew the business because he's got a huge staff. He's in his early 20s. The whole business has been growing organically. He hasn't got any VC himself, which actually surprised me when he told me the story of how big he is and, and what they're doing and, and sort of who's on their board. I was quite surprised that it wasn't sort of a, a VC-funded business, but it's all been growing organically with him and his business partner. And they're about to head over to Silicon Valley and take over the US with their business, which is uh, super exciting because they've got a great little model which we talk about in the conversation. And uh, yeah, it's almost like, as I said, two conversations in one today. Yeah, and as always, you know, I think you've put a good frame on there. There's the two conversations in one, but it's not just about app development. It is about business development that you talk about. Um, And just to give you some idea of the scale, I think, you know, just looking at their website, I'll put a link to it in the show notes, but, you know, these guys have done stuff for, they are Australian, you know, and have been based in Australia, so they've done people like the Herald Sun, the Australian, the Sydney Morning Herald, the ABC Network, but also they've done international brands that people should have heard of, if they're, you know, if you're listening to, if you're a Preneur community member, like Lifehacker, Wired Magazine, Mashable, you know, these guys have done some pretty huge clients, um, so, you know, it, they know a bit about business. They know a bit about getting in front of people. Um, so definitely there's something, in, as always, something in this for everybody. So let's jump in and listen to Pete talking to Mark McDonald of Abster. 
All right, Mark. So it's been probably five or six years at least since we uh, first met over lunch and been very little contact in between. So I can't claim any of your amazing success in that time period, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but do you want to like share a bit of your story about Appster and what you've done with that business and how it's grown to 100 staff in what, four, four or five years? Yeah, actually, um, three, two and a half years now. So, um, but thank you for that. Um, basically, um, Appster is a is a is a startup builder. So we're a company that um, works a lot with startup companies, and um, more specifically, mostly in mobile. Um, so we make mobile apps and things like that. Um, really, the last couple of years have been pretty crazy. Um, we started off um, like most small businesses, I guess, with you know one or two people in a room, um, and then basically um, kind of scaled from there. And now we're in a couple of different countries, um, and yeah, making lots and lots of projects. Mate, you're doing a fantastic effort. So, appster.com is the, the no, URL? No, no, appster.com.au. Ah, sorry, mate. I've got to uh, get that fixed. Don't send it to the competitor. <laughs> <laughs> all right, cool. So, in terms of app making, obviously, that's what your primary business is all about. Obviously, you work with startups and help grow the overall yep. business, not just the actual development of the app. But obviously, you know, app development is a big core of, of what you guys do for clients. So, that's kind of where I'd love to take this conversation because I think a lot of people are interested in this app space and, you know, monetization of apps and, you know, getting their idea out there, which I think is really, really good. But there's some really cool ideas I know that you guys have done with clients. I want to talk about that if that's okay. Of course, of course. Um, so I, I think that um, there's a, a massive opportunity on the app store. And even if you look at not just mobile, but like, you know, new opportunities like wearable, like Google Glass, for instance, is going to have apps on them, et cetera. Um, but yeah, a lot, a lot of clients come to us and they, and they really, um, you know, they're building a, an app. So, um, whether it's a game or whether it's a, some sort of augmented reality utility app they're going to sell to somebody. I mean, there's, I mean, the sky's the limit, really. Hmm. Is it from a very high level perspective? And I know there's every area of the app store has huge success stories, but yep. is there a particular area of the app store that you think is a smarter place to play, whether it's gaming or whether it's a, a, a tool or, or things like that, where it's actually easier to, to market and monetize? Yeah, I, I think that, um, I think that there's, there's a couple. Of, um, so like generically, like where most of the money on the app store is actually spent is obviously gaming, um, both on Android and iOS. There's a huge amount of money that's spent on gaming. However, I wouldn't necessarily say that's the best place to start um, on the App Store. And the reason is we actually have a project manager here at App Store that was involved in a large amount of, you know, big title games. So, you know, these are, you know, typically a movie comes out or a major character and they, what they do is they take that movie character or they take that popular series and they turn it into a game. And based on the franchise value, it really takes off. And, and the problem with games is that, you know, Flappy Bird is a recent example of maybe <laughs> an outlier there, but a, a lot of the game part of the app store is really controlled by maybe 20 to 50 major publishers that not only have a huge network to interpromote each other, but at the same time, they, they also have this franchise value um, where they can actually, you know, whether it's Superman or, you know, something like the Simpsons, you know, they already have these branded apps, which they already have licensing deals with. So um, in terms of like where there's opportunity on the app store, I mean, there's always different parts which are growing. Um, the, you know, the mobile health space is a really big thing. Um, particularly like things like, um, alternative medicine, um, different ways to improve efficiencies when visiting doctors and things like that. Um, we've had a lot of clients go into that kind of space. The payment space is really interesting. Um, if you're, if you're not, as long as you're not trying, I mean, they can get very complex very quickly, but even some things, some clients are building simple, you know, projects where, you know, one person can, you know, send the other person a reminder that they owe them money. So, I mean, I think that there's a huge trend towards like making stuff easier for the consumer, like taking offline trends, things that already happen offline. Like you do go to the doctors offline. Like you do, you know, borrow money off a friend when you want to buy a beer. Like, so, I mean, these things that traditionally were done offline in a more inefficient manner, people are building apps around them. And, and that's really, you know, that's really where people are kind of getting some like long, app stores where it's not just kind of like the hype of an app is popular for a week and then it just dies off mm. speaking of flappy birds because that as you said was a ridiculously uh yeah successful outlier i guess like the thing that the story that i've heard and i haven't delved much into it is that there was was a developer in a, a third world country i think i could be i think incorrect. it's vietnam vietnam yep. and he made this app that looks very similar to mario brothers yes uh, <laughs> and 
you know, it was on the App Store for quite a while before it went viral. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the guy had been a developer for a while, and I think my understanding is that he'd actually been a developer of a number of other projects. They were still relatively successful, but Flappy Bird was, of course, his um, big hit, um, and you know, I think it was making fifty thousand to a hundred thousand dollars a day. Um, now, the interesting thing about Flappy Bird is that this is kind of what we call we tell clients the law of opposites. So um, you look at what all your competitors are kind of doing on the App Store, whether you're making a game or whether you're making like like a new way to pay people, like a payment system, or no matter, no matter what you're building, like whatever your app idea is you're building, you always look at what all of the established people are doing and do the opposite. One of the really interesting things about Flappy Bird was it was really hard. Like it was not a simple game to play. And it was almost like the, the reason people it became so popular was the fact that it was so hard. Um, and a big part of apps um, today is not, you know, obviously like, the ground level where you have to be is you have to make a quality product. There's over a million apps between the two app stores. Um, and you, you can't just, you, the gone are the days where you can put up a crappy amateurish thing and expect it to generate an ROI because, um, that's just really not where the app store market is. Um, now the other thing is that, you know, so you make a great product. That's step one. But then the question is, how do people talk about it? And I think, I think in the old days, and, and Flappy Bird perhaps is an, a better example of this, you know, people would just tell other people about it because it was something that was really good. Like if you look at Spotify, for instance, it's a web app, it's a sort of a desktop app, and, and it's on mobile as well. Um, a product like that, people tell other people about it, but the way it's shared is actually intrinsically built into the product. So if you look at every time you play a song on Spotify, it actually will tell your Facebook friends. Um, in a more simple way, um, and I actually don't recommend this for all apps. In fact, the actual creator of Flappy Bird said it was a bit of a fluke that the app took off, to be honest. But what he had going for him was, the fact that it was the exact opposite of most games, which are ten, gen, generally the best practice in games is make it really easy for a couple of levels, get the hook, then get harder. That's kind of the most common way game designers produce products. Um, but what's really interesting is he did the exact opposite and, and was very successful because people talked about it, people shared their scores on Facebook, and, and they went and he went social that way. So I think that the big question, whether it's Flappy Bird or whatever you're doing, is how do I make a product where the outcome of what I'm doing, so whether it's playing a game or whether it's you know bragging about eating healthy vegetables or whatever whatever the outcome is, there has to be some sort of content or some sort of output that's produced that is you know it makes me look better if I share it that I can brag about to my friends that's kind of elite or rare something that I mean that I mean you look at Farmville or you look at any of these really successful apps and 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 fundamentally whether it's on web or mobile or wearable technology whatever sort of platform they're working on. The principles stay the same. I think that's why Flappy was, was successful. But, you know, I think that in a lot of ways, the developer really got lucky as well. Mm. And I do find it bizarre. And I'd love to sort of hopefully read a story one day after someone's better get this guy in a, in a room to interview him and work out why he decided to take that down if it's making 50 grand a day because that's, <laughs> it's, it's yeah. very counterintuitive for us entrepreneurs going, if you've got something making $50,000 a day, are you crazy, stop man? <laughs> but, well, I, I think I think it's it's an interesting thing, and I think that um you know there's a, there was a lot of um in, in our office, for instance, there was a lot of conspiracy theories. Oh, did he take it down because the Vietnam government was onto him, and and etc. Or did he take it down because you know it was a marketing stunt because he's rolling out five or six more? You know, I guess no one will ever know until we ask him. Absolutely, and I'm keen to see it. So, you know, one of the things you mentioned there was sort of the inbuilt marketing that you try and do, and you know, obviously the the term of the moment is growth hacking, which, yep. you know, in my opinion is just smart marketing and has been for decades. It's just yeah, now got exactly. a, it's got a name to it as a new division of marketing or direct response marketing or, you know, measurable marketing. But, you know, I think, you know, Ryan Holiday's um, recent book, Growth Hacker Marketing, kind of sums up it all very, very well and is definitely worth a, a read on the Kindle. But besides kind of just trying to be smart about your app development and, and baking into it some of this social sharing um, and gamification type models. What are sort of the best ways to market an app that you've seen your clients do? Is it a matter of sort of getting on the app store and buying a whole bunch of reviews or is it, you know, what is the, the smart and, and integral way to actually market an app these days? Yeah, um, well, yeah, like, like you said, it very much comes down to building a product that wows people. Um, I think it, I think that it's very hard to market something that's really crappy. And a lot of times people make really crappy games and they come back and get in touch with us and say, I made this game for this other developer, but 
how do I actually um, promote it? And I think that's the wrong way to do it. First of all, if you look at anything, you know, whether it's Flappy Bird or Spotify or anything that really rose up in the app store rankings and was there for a long time and actually became a sustainable business, the product is very different and it's much better executed. So I'd say start there. When it comes to actually marketing it, um, and there's, there's so many different ways, and um, I really recommend that, you know, if you're really interested in trying to learn how to um, market a product, you read a book called Lean Analytics. Um, because I think that marketing an app is very scientific. Um, the clients that do really well, they figure, they test a lot of things in really small ways, whether it's, you know, Facebook ads or social or whether it's even buying, you know, media space and other ads. They test a small amount and then they basically scale that based on the data. But I think that, I think that you know, you go through through a couple of different stages um, before you just randomly just market and scale things. Like the first thing you start off with is kind of what they call empathy. Like you figure out, is what I'm making something the market actually genuinely wants? Um, And then you're trying to look at something like retention. You know, there's no point building this app and spending a lot of money on marketing or, you know, spending a lot of time doing free marketing if people aren't going to reuse it again. Like if there's a fundamental problem with how the app works or if it's just not addictive enough or if we need to optimize it so people keep using it, that's what the analytics will tell us. And then, and then once you have the retention, people are using it and, and you're, you're happy people are coming back. Because, by the way, um, a lot of the stats, um, one of the stats I was reading recently, 95% of apps are abandoned after the first month and about 50 to 60% after the first time somebody uses them. So, I mean, I mean, the abandonment on most apps is really, really high. And I think that that's a really easy win for people before they actually go and scale. And most people actually have no idea because they're not using an analytics package. Um, and then once you have that and you're happy with, you know, you've got, you've got people using it, you have to look at the virality side of things, which is how do we get one person in our app to tell six other people? In my opinion, it's really not worth, you know, scaling marketing. And I, I will talk to you about the marketing strategies in a sec, but there's no point even going to that stage and spending all of your money until you can legitimately say, and you've got, you know, co- You've got actual data in your in your analytics is saying one person is bringing in five, six, seven, whatever the number is, other people into my app. Because if you look at Spotify, if you look at any of these huge apps, they don't advertise on other sites. They don't, you know, they don't get TV ads. Their best advertising is the fact that one user tells X number of other users. It's just inherently built into their model. And then once you finally crack the code on that and you fig- and then you figure out, you know, how much is each user worth to me, that's very simple. It's really simple if it's um if it's just a paid app. Like if we're selling this thing for 99 cents, it's obvious that the value of the customer is 99 cents minus Apple's 30%. Um, so you figure out what your lifetime customer value is, but that's not always so obvious with free apps. For instance, a freemium app where the actual app is free but you're making money on maybe you know in-app purchases or some sort of back-end monetization there as well. Um, it actually takes a little bit of time and data to actually figure out what every person is worth. And if you don't know that, once again, it's very difficult to jump to the next stage um, mm-hmm. of actually scaling marketing. So by that time, before you even thought about marketing, you should have only spent a tiny little money, little bit of money on um, you know marketing and testing. You finally get to the stage where you're marketing. You, you know you know what your customers worth. You know how many, you know, the virality of your project, how many people one person is telling. And you also know the retention. You know, people are coming back, they're using it. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with your product. Because by the way, um, a lot of people don't even get to marketing. A lot of startups decide to close down before they, or even apps, I should say, decide to close down and not even continue because they don't get there. Or, or the worst case scenario is they just throw a bunch of money at it and it's like, let's buy some ads. And they get some downloads initially, but then it, Dry, it dies down. Now, in terms of the final stage, when you actually get to marketing, um, at that stage, what you really need to be looking at is, you know, what works for you. It's really an analytics question. Test small and figure it out. In, in terms of what clients have used before, I mean, we've seen business models where mobile Facebook advertising is really huge. I would say, like, um, I, know, I know a I know a lady that's getting you know three to four thousand downloads a week of her app at about twenty cents a pop, and basically, um. The interesting thing about that is she knows her lifetime customer value is 2 or $3. Um, so she's buying them really cheap and it's scaling, but it makes financial sense for her so she can buy advertising. Some other people, it, it has to be a completely free model. Like they're contacting, um, they're contacting, you know, influencers in social media. Like often, you know, often people on Facebook or maybe YouTube aren't particularly interested in promoting something because they're, you know, these are top tier social networks. You know, if I'm an expert on fishing, I'm probably getting approached all the time by fishing by fishing people trying to sell me, you know, to promote my book, 
promote my app, that kind of thing. You get that all the day. But if you look at other smaller networks, say Tumblr, things like that, these um, these kind of people, especially like I've got a client right now in fashion who's trying to scale something in fashion, their strategy is let's go to all of the girls and boys that have, you know, Tumblr fashion blogs and actually get them on board, make them VIPs, make them an important part of the app, you know, recognize them and get them to promote it to their, their list. So I think I think that there's so many different ways to market a product. And I would say that like a lot of this stuff, it's not really like rocket science. Like the actual real challenge is actually the steps before that. Because anyone can spend, you know, you know, if you gave me a million dollars today, I could get you, I could get you, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars, a hundred thousand of your downloads. The problem is, is that million dollars well spent or how are you going to get that million dollars? Because uh, an investor is going to want to actually know, a savvy investor is actually going to want to know, you know, how, how scalable is your project? You know, how many people are reusing it? You know, what's, what's the virality of your project? Mm. Because it, I, I've had, I'll give you just um, one, one more example. We had a, we had a person come in and I won't mention names. Um, they basically built an app from, and it was actually, you probably, if I, if I said the name, you'd probably know about it um, because they were a fast growing social network in Australia. And um, these guys were signing up between 10, I think 10 to 50,000 users a week. It was really insane at the peak. But then they went and they were sure, oh, we're in the next Silicon Valley. We're going to be big, et cetera. We're going to raise venture capital overseas and grow and scale and do the marketing thing. But they actually didn't get any capital. Um, in my understanding is they didn't raise anything just purely because um, the this, this savvy investor said, well, the retention's not good enough and not, not enough people are telling the other person about it. So um, they're really important as well. I think that's a really that's important really- thing is that, you know, a lot of people when they, you know, write a blog post or even want, want to go out and find out, okay, where should I market my app? They want to know, okay, go to Facebook and buy these sort of ads at 20 yeah. cents a click and like that kind of stuff. And, you know, that's kind of the, the easy stuff and, you know, the sexy stuff to hear about and, and read about. But you, you're right. You absolutely have to know what your metrics are all the way through. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't think about is the retention side of stuff and that, mm. like, you know, I've spoken to a lot of people and, and done some app development myself and the retention conversation is something that very rarely pops up in the low level uh, mm. conversation around app development. Obviously, once you get to the point of talking to VCs and, and, and trying to raise some capital, that's obviously what these people want. They want to know the metrics. But, you yeah. know, retention... But, of, I mean, yeah, even, even, sorry to cut you off, even like at the, you know, you're a one person or two person like team just trying to launch an app, you know, a couple of friends, like you need to do that analytics Absolutely. from day one because, you know, I mean, we definitely deal with like the high-end projects where we also deal a lot with clients who are just starting with an idea and the biggest mistake they make is they just don't know their numbers. So they, they say, oh, how do I how do I get users? And you know, I can give you a hundred different ways to get users. I mean, I've seen everyone um, do things from I've seen clients rent out, you know, um, rent out amusement parks, like um, like throw huge parties with thousands of people. Uh, you know, seen people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a day on marketing. You know, I've seen a lot of different ways to promote an app, but fundamentally, the, the they always fail or, or, or succeed based on the numbers because marketing. And the thing is, marketing isn't this creative pursuit where it's just like, oh, I feel like this will work or my gut says this will work. It's really scientific, like especially in downloads and, and getting mm. user acquisition. It's like, here are the numbers, here's what it says, and let's scale this way. Yeah, and that's something I think a lot of people just don't think about because it's not spoken about enough in that lower level kind of app development world, which is such a shame because it is mm. really a key fundamental to a lot of stuff. Absolutely. So- so moving on from the marketing side of stuff, you touched on a lot about the monetization things, and you know I've got a big pet peeve with the the, the iTunes store and the way it's affected monetization and a lot of different things. I really do, yep. quote unquote, blame iTunes and the app market for the lowering of prices and the increase in expectations. Because I think if you went back, you know, five six years ago, what people would be willing to pay for a software application like you know, OmniFocus or a game like um, Candy Crush, something like that, was yeah. 15 20 30 $40 because, yeah. you know, the quality of the application kind of justified that investment of money. And I still think it does. But, you know, in my opinion, I think people who were technically savvy uh, but not marketing savvy originally kind of created these apps out there. And the only way they could think of to market it was put bare bones pricing against it and just like have that race to the bottom. And I think that kind of shifted the market significantly, which, you know, has created a lot of opportunity. Don't get me wrong. But mm-hmm. I, I have a fundamental issue with that from a 
uh, a marketer's perspective. Now, obviously, you know, economics change industries and markets quite regularly, and so I, I get it what it's caused. So I'm keen to hear your take on that, having your you know marketing background before going into Appsta. But also then yep. I want to talk about just, you know, monetization in general for apps and sort of, you know, there's so many different ways now, but, you know, what's your take on sort of how the industry has shifted the perception of value uh, and also, you know, what are you finding is working really well? Because obviously you can sell the app at a price point. You've got apps that are free and they're monetized by in-app purchases and there's apps that are free that are monetized by advertising. What seems to be working in what space and, and that sort of stuff? Yeah, um, that's, a, that's a very a very interesting point, actually, because I think that um, value hasn't fundamentally changed, in my opinion. I mean, I think people have different value. Like, I think that what the App Store did was it made software more readily available to more people. Sure. Um, so, for instance, software developers, um, I mean, um, our CTO has actually been programming longer than I've been alive. So, I actually <laughs> have had a couple of chats with him about this kind of um, thing. And, you know, what we've kind of, you know, well, a, t- a couple of topics that we've talked about and, and one of them was, you know, what software used to be like, you know, 10, 20 years ago. And I think that, you know, the big thing with the App Store is that, you know, when you launch a product, the world is really your oyster. Like, are we going to sell this in Vietnam? Are we going to sell this in the US? It's really just, it's not a matter of, you know, physically setting up offices or building a sales force there or getting distribution in stores, retail stores, I should say. It's really just a matter of clicking a couple of buttons and maybe some translation. So, of course, um, I think the business model is fundamentally, in general, changed from being, you know, high ticket items with high margins through to smaller kind of projects with more competition. That's for sure. But I think it kind of comes down to, you know, target audience um, and also how they're going to use the product. And I'll give you an example about target audience um, and versus features. So. Um, Target audience, um, let's, there's, a, there's a pretty famous DJ app on the App Store, which I actually can't remember the name of. Um, but basically, they have two versions of this app, right? So they have an iPad version of the DJing app. And basically, it's kind of like a, a mixtape. You know, it's, it's, I'm not a DJ, so my lingo is probably off. But it's basically got the basics that you would need to start DJing like, at a party. They have a so it's not a game. It's an actual like, utility. No, it's, it's actually a utility, absolutely. Um, a, really, a really nicely made app. And... Um, the thing is, the iPhone version last time I checked was $0.99, cents, but the iPad version was around 20 or $30. Um, but if you think about that, it's actually quite intelligent because the people that would use the iPhone version are very different to the people that use an iPad version. For instance, the iPhone user might be a kid or they might be, you know, someone like me. So it's like, oh, I'm a DJ. I'll check it out. But <laughs> I would never like, I would never get up at a party and start DJing because I would look like an idiot, right? But the iPad version, it could legitimately be like not a professional DJ, but someone who's actually trying to learn and play around with it. And the value to them is much higher. Mm. So I think it comes down to the feature set, but also who's actually using it. Um, I'll give you another example. Um, we, we had another client that was, um, um, basically, they they build they replaced um you know there's a way of training um doctors on certain medical devices and and the problem is when a, a junior doctor is learning um, my understanding is that they don't really have that much fake equipment to test on like it's either the real stuff or not the real stuff um, and they don't really make fake demo stuff um you know especially in like places like when they're training in um, war, you know, in, in the middle of a war or in a battle where, you know, our client was serving, you know, the U.S. Army, etc. So basically they couldn't really drag this million dollar, $10 million equipment over to the middle of, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan because it was just completely unfeasible. So basically like the value, the cost proposition there is, you know, you can spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars or you can buy a app for ten or 20000 so it's it's really a value proposition. I think like what is the actual value to the user? Um, you know, is it like is someone who's in you know purchasing in the military, you know, the military medical wing? Are they are they interested in you know? Do they think ten thousand dollars is expensive for this app when the actual equipment when it does exactly the same and it, it actually replicates to a T what a real device would do for for training simulation purposes? Mm. Or is it you know or and a lot of the time it comes into value. The other thing we've seen a lot is, um, you know, re, rebranding stuff for different audiences. Like a lot of clients actually, like they might find that like their product, like, so let's say we're making a time management software, for instance, you know, the value for a time management software for a student, for instance, it could be a free app. Like they might just say, I'm not paying for that. But the value for a great time management software for an entrepreneur or, or you know, I, I've got um, an app on my um both my phone and my Mac called Things 2. And mm-hmm. I think it's about $50 actually. And I would pay that like over and over and over again. 
can. Because the thing is, like, the amount of productivity I get from actually using that software is so high. And the fact is, like, honestly, my whole life is planned in this thing. So, you know, if they if things came and say, oh, by the way, the new updated thing, the update of things is $300, I would pay that in a heartbeat. So it comes down to value. Um, but I guess to answer your question a bit more specifically about different monetization models, I think that, I think that, um, I'm not really a massive fan of 99 cent apps, um, to be honest. Um, and I think that that's kind of the default that a lot of clients and a lot of people who are trying mm. to build apps fall to. They say, Oh, I'll just start with 99 cents and they'll see how it goes. And they never install analytics. They never test any other prices. They just assume that 99 cents is the number, put it up there. Maybe they get brave and put it to $1.99, but then they, they just wonder why their app isn't successful. So, but this is the problem, I think. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to cut you off, Mark. But of I think this is the problem is they think, well, if I sell it for 99 cents, I'm going to sell twice as much because it's cheap. And, no, like, it's, and it gives me a bit of freedom to be lazier with my marketing. And I think that's just a... Uh, a crime on your business Absolutely. and that's Absolutely. my fundamental issue so well yeah, yeah agreed. I, I, I really agree with that i think that you know just i mean just, you know a great marketed app and a great product for ten dollars on 9.99 is, is always going to sell more than a product that is you know 99 cents with no marketing mm. um, because i mean a lot of these great apps are actually quite expensive i mean not all apps are cheap but i also think uh, I'm, I'm more interested not in the price um, to be honest with you, I'm more interested in the average value per download. Like what, this is coming back to the analytics in me, like what, how much is a person worth? Like if you don't know that, that's silly. And you might find that, you know, for instance, what we do know from the statistics is that if you have a limited audience, if you only have, let's say I'm selling an app for gardeners with left hands in Geelong, right? Um, there's a, probably a small kind of target audience. What I do know with those kind, that audience is I would probably go towards a free app, probably a uh, sorry a paid app with premium pricing because the the actual value per download is actually much higher because obviously you're getting all the money up front. However, if I'm looking at something like it's mass market, let's say for instance Dropbox actually decided to charge money up front for it, it would never have been the success that it is today no. because fundamentally Dropbox is a very different beast. It's a mass market product. And you need to think like, is my product so niche? There's only a small amount of people. I need to maximize the value per download up front. Or is it something where, you know, there is a huge target market and this doesn't matter if it's a game or if it's a utility or whatever, where if I give it away for free and, I, and my, and obviously something free is going to attract more people into it to try it. And if I could get, you know, one, two or 3% of those people to convert across into paid clients or paid customers, that would be worth it to me. I'll give you an example of that. Um, one of our, like I said, one of our project managers worked on a, a big project. Um, um, it was basically a big famous, um, um, big famous TV series for, um, little girls called My Little Pony. Mm -hmm. uh, you've probably heard of that. And apparently, I only found this out recently that um, if you're a guy, an older guy that likes My Little Pony, and apparently there's a lot of them, you're called a brony. <laughs> um, so apparently, all the developers on My Little Pony by the end were converted across to it. But the interesting thing about this project is it was free. Like they didn't charge money up front because they knew. Um, that if we give this app away for free, kids will download it because their parents were like, I only download the free apps. But what they also knew is that if they designed the product the right way and if they got people coming back over and over again, that's a retention thing, then we would have more people upgrading, buying coins, buying extra things and stuff like that when their parents let them. Obviously, that's an ethical thing. Like, at what stage do you kind of like warn children? And, and that I, I've, 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 had a, I've written a little bit about that on our blog and, and spoken to a couple of other like media sources about that. But um, that's a separate issue. But the point is, like, is my product something that's so mass market that, you know, I can give it away for free and if I just get 3 4 5% across, that will make me a really successful business? Or is it such a niche product where I should be charging up front and maximizing the value per download up front? Absolutely. I think that's the thing. You've got to be strategic about it too in terms of, you know, what it is you're trying to do with the business model and, and, and what is the perfect message to market match and, and, and or the marketing to market match. And I think that's really savvy. Yeah, and I think that I think that there's different tactics for each different one. Like for instance, like the stats show us and the research that we've done and a lot of research um, by big analytics firms in the US says that, you know, if you're gonna do I just throw in two tips here. If you're gonna throw if you're gonna do a paid app, make sure it has paid, but you also have in app purchases on top of that. Because the thing is I think it's around thirty to forty percent more revenue per download just by putting in in-app purchases, which is kind of crazy because you think people would get angry because they've already spent money and you're trying to ask them for more money in the app. 
But, you know, if they've actually paid for your app, they're more likely to use it. And if they use it, they're probably going to want to upgrade to different versions. Like, for instance, um, perhaps I, I'm doing a, um, I'm using a time management tool and I need more space. I need more file storage. These kind of things are natural upgrades. So if you're doing paid, don't be afraid to do in-app purchases. The second thing is you, if you're doing freemium, you either have to do two things. Number one is you have to get people using your app in such a way, like if we're doing, building a general utility, you have to find a way that people buy into it and start putting stuff in it as soon as possible. Like Evernote, for instance, or Evernote, for instance, is a, is, um, is a free product. Um, basically, the great thing about Evernote is that you keep using it they, they get you in. You create one note. They remind you to do something else. And they know that if they can get you just make one note or do one thing, you're more likely to continue to use it. And if you use it for five or six months, then you're more likely to pay for upgraded storage. So you either have to become an integral part of someone's process, whether that's you know in health, whether that's in productivity, whatever sort of app you're making. You have to kind of get in. And I would say the best strategy to do that is just get a little bit of micro-commitment. Don't worry about teaching everyone about the whole app. Just get them to enter a date in or write one note or do something because they're much more likely to be engaged and not, you know, like I said, 95% of apps aren't used after the first month. So you've got to keep getting them back. Um, the second thing is if you're doing, if you're building a game in this space, I um, mean, you're doing freemium, two things. Number one is you need to have some sort of element of chance in it. If you look at like the My Little Pony app that we didn't make, but one of our producers made, um, basically, they actually have, they had the question, like, how do we keep people coming back over and over again? So if you look at anything like the, the Hobbit game or My Little Pony or any of these big franchise games, they always have an element of, you know, chance. Like in the Hobbit game, you win tokens so you can get, um, you know, more swords and things like that. And it's just a way because they know that the more time someone comes back to it, the more likely they are to get involved, the more likely they are to actually continue to purchase more things. Um, and in My Little Pony, it was kind of like, well, I think the developers were like, from my understanding, were like, oh, how do I do this ethically? Like, these are kids. We can't put like a carnival. We can't put like a casino in this thing. Or, you know, because I mean, you can't do that. It's really unethical. But what they found was, you know, we'll make a carnival. They can win prizes and tokens and things like that. And like I said, that comes back to um, a big ethical debate in the app development industry right now is like monetizing to children because, uh, you know, a lot of people come back and they say, oh, my kid spent $900 on apps, so I decided I better make an app. <laughs> <laughs> but there, there's some advice. Like, which, like, I think broadly speaking, monetization falls into those two platforms. Is it going to be free or is it going to be paid? Yeah, I love it. Now, one thing in terms of when we talk about money, and you kind of touched on yep. this earlier, Mark, in that obviously you know, development as these apps, the value in the app needs to increase. Obviously, the cost of development you know, it has to increase as well. It's basic yeah. economics of business. So, you know, for a lot of people, you hear about the these, all these apps and these startups who are mobile-based raising yeah. a lot of VC and angel investing. I know a lot of your clients uh, have done a lot of that and you kind of help them out yeah. with that in various ways. I'd love to kind Absolutely. of just talk about the whole the VC world and the angel world in terms of mobiles and apps, like a, obviously you you touch on, you need to have your analytics correct to actually know the value per download and the value per client and your retention rates and all that sort of data that is going to be of interest to an yeah. investor. But yeah. you know, what are investors looking for? At what stage can you go and raise capital? What's the best way to go and raise capital? Who do you talk to? Where do you go if you've got an idea or uh, or an app in some sort of development stage? Yeah, um, that's a that's an awesome question, and I, I think that to be honest with you, that is a huge problem. I'd say, to be honest with you, um, I, I go to we actually ha- run our own startup events and stuff like that, and I go to I go to all of these events that we run, you know, a couple hundred people, and and I speak to dozens of people every night, and and basically one of the really interesting things I'm like, so what's what's really holding you guys back? What's stopping you from going to the next level? And it's never like, oh, we can't get our app developed properly or it's 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 rarely, oh, we need marketing. It's always like if we could just get a little bit more money, man, we could get to the next stage. We could hire the marketing guy. You know, we could spend more on advertising. We could get our analytics in. We could upgrade these features. So I think that, you know, when it comes to, you know, I've got an idea to an app to actually want to make it, there's two paths people usually go down. The first path is, okay, well, I know realistically I could get together, you know, $5,000, $3,000, $4,000. I'll just get a couple of friends together. We'll save up. We'll put some money in. And then we'll get it done in something like Elance or Odesk. And there's been a, you know, I'm I'm, I'm not bad mouthing that because I think that does work for some people. But um, I think there's been a real big trend um, towards, uh, especially like a lot of um, media channels have talked about, oh, you can make an app for $500 doing this or this on these sites. And to be honest with you, that's just not my experience. Um, you know, basically, I think that 
even the best developers in India. We were just chatting um, before um, we jumped on this podcast. You know, some of the developers that we have overseas actually are getting paid more than our developers in Australia. So um, it's, it's like good development no matter where they are, whether you're outsourcing to India or, you know, wherever. They're going to be expensive because great people are wanted all over the world in different places. So it fundamentally comes down to the quality of the people you're producing. So then how do you get the capital to do that? Well, um, I think that if you're staying away from the let's do it cheap and let's do it the right way, which I think personally for me is like if you're going to do it, you better do it well, you, you need to understand what stage you're at. And I guess you need to understand the value proposition you're bringing. Um, we, you know, we hear from you know, thousands and thousands of people about, you know, different ways to monetize, um, sorry, different ways to, you know, get an app. Um, and they want to do an app, they want to build an app, they've got this idea for an app. But the biggest thing is they, they've got no commitment. There's no one who's actually going to do it. Like only a small amount of people actually say, I've got an idea, let's commit to making it. Probably one in a hundred, to be honest. Um, so when you go to an investor with nothing and you say, hey, I've got an idea for an app, there's no value in that. Like there's, I mean, there's nothing stopping them from doing it themselves if they're an unethical developer. You've got no intellectual property, you have nothing. So I think that it comes down to trying to build the value up as long as possible. Um, for instance, like, um, you know, my company, we, we grew, we grew ourselves to, you know, you know, nearly, you know, t- eight, you know, eight figures a year without raising our own venture capital. Um, and we took, we've, we've got stakes in a whole range of different startups. So like we were able to do the, which is ultimately the best thing, which is not actually take on investors. If you can get away from investors, that's a good thing. Um, and obviously, as you scale and get bigger and bigger, that's the, the further down the value line it takes to actually take on investors, the better it's going to be for you. Um, so I think that at the early stages, um, who are you speaking to? Well, to be honest with you, a venture capitalist or an angel investor is really not going to be the kind of person for you when you've just got an idea. You need to get it down the page um, a bit further. You need to get a business plan, perhaps. Um, you need to go and do a prototype. You need to do something where there's some value. Um, and at that stage, the kind of best investors for you are kind of co-founders, to be honest. Like, you know, I, I would never really recommend building an app without, you know, having one or two other people and that have complementary skills because they can put in a little bit of money too. And as long as, like, you don't want to take on investment too early or you can really get kicked out of your baby and you can really burn and destroy what you're building really fast. So um, the best kind of money comes from friends and family at that stage, you know, put in 5,000 here, put in 6,000 here, that kind of thing. Um, then it comes like you get your product out, you build what's called a minimal viable product. Um, and you really, the big mistake a lot of development companies do is they try and commit clients to making these huge versions of their product. So instead of saying, okay, what is the absolute core of what we're trying to create here? Let's actually make the whole thing. You know, Facebook didn't make the whole thing when they started. The first version of Facebook wasn't actually that good. But that's a bit, for some reason, most, you know, new clients think, hey, let's make the whole thing. So the first thing (laughs) you do is cut it down to its core. um, And that will reduce your development costs up front. And let's say you've got your MVP, you've launched your product and you've got some money from friends and family. Um, Then it becomes more, okay, let's approach angel investors. And these are typically guys that will put in three, four hundred thousand. And I'll give you an example of that actually. Um, one of our clients recently was called Blue Dot. Um, you can read about them. They were featured in the Australian as a potential billion-dollar startup. What was really interesting about these guys, I, I know Philippe and Emma, all the founders, quite well. What they essentially did was they started off doing exactly what I'm telling you. They got friends and family and a little bit of money up front, and they built a prototype. They built a very small version of their app. They built an MVP. And they didn't even have an app at that stage. They just had a little bit of code and something they could patent. Then they basically went along um, and they looked for investors. They showed them what they did. Um, they ha- and they grew and they got some momentum, signed some MOUs, got some potential clients. They actually had two banks bidding against each other to acquire the technology they were building, which is interesting. And then basically at that stage, they were ready to go to investors because they could say, okay, we've actually got a track record here. We're building something great. And at that stage, you're not begging investors. They're kind of like really keen to get involved, etc. So um, I think it really depends on, to answer your question more succinctly, it really depends on where you're at in the funding cycle. Like to be honest with you, I would, it sounds kind of probably maybe not what you're thinking, but I wouldn't really tell client, tell people to go and get an investor or a VC or an angel investor from day one. Like the longer you can do what's called bootstrap it, which is build off sales, build off, you know, sponsorship, build off friends and family, that kind of thing. The, the longer you can hold out investment from external parties, the more you can control your vision, the more you can make a better product, and the more you can stay really focused on building something great and not getting distracted by the 
the glamour and distraction that sometimes investors bring on. Yeah, yeah I, I couldn't agree. Couldn't well, agree. I, think I think something that I um, was thinking about as you were talking there when it comes to this is like a lot of people I, uh, I know would be like, oh, I can't ask my family and friends for money because what happens if it goes wrong? Yeah. And I think they kind of think of this VC and angel world as monopoly money with no, no it's risk not. attached. It's like, well, I'll get some you know random VC's money who is you know they know it's a risk. They're going to throw it at it, and you know they they they, they know they're going to only have one win every hundred investments, and that's not the way yep. you should be going into business. Is no, that, absolutely you know, I think not. if you really believe in your business and you are going to play full out in your business, then getting money from family or friends is a good litmus test to yeah. see how serious you are about the idea. I'm not saying everyone should go and get money from family and friends. There's pros yeah. and cons to that, and I can see the value in it. But I think if you're not willing to even entertain that idea of getting money from family and friends to st- help your startup business, that mm. should say a lot to you about how invested you are in this idea, willing mm. to play full, full out, belief in its possibility of success. So you're you're think- so right. You're so right. I mean, it fundamentally comes down to commitment. And I think that, you know, I'm not advocating like, by any means, you know, go create a war with your family by taking all the money. It has to be the, the right decision <laughs> agree, of for those guys. And, and, you know, it has to be the right decision and they need to know that the risks associated with it. And, you know, but to be honest with you, if you think that investors are going to be nicer to you if you fail than your friends and family, then you don't understand startup. <laughs> you don't understand venture capital. I mean, if you bring, if you're, if you're woefully negligent and to a VC or someone like that, they're going to sue you. They're going to, they've got expensive, expensive lawyers and, um, you know, they've done this before. They're a huge, they're huge firms. So, um, I don't, th- I think you're right. Like, I mean, the attitude that, you know, somehow <laughs> these investors that they don't really care, they'll put the money, et cetera. It's just not the thing. Like these often are professional manage managers. They've been, you know, owned businesses before. Um, they're really savvy. Often they're ball breakers. Um, investors you know the reason they have money is they're savvy investors right they don't just throw money around willy-nilly i think that's just a common myth um out there i I would also i would also say i love what you said about commitment too because um you know some people for some people it's an idea or a dream i'll just make an app and and it's you know and i get that so for some people it's just not like that but it's actually like it's actually really hard work like I look back at, you know, the guys that are really, guys and girls that have really succeeded and done well in this space and, you know, clients I've known and colleagues and things like that. And these guys, like, they've been so committed to it. It hasn't just been like throw it on the app store. It's been like, okay, we're flying to this country to pitch, you know, to pitch this potential customer on a partnership. You know, we're going to go and, you know, uh, um, meet this potential executive. We're going to go and, you know, whatever it takes. And I think that, you know, some people, and it sounds really counterintuitive um, because, you know, I own an app development company myself and I'm in a number of startups. You know, it, it, what everyone's saying is, you know, it's easy, it's really simple, but it's actually absolutely not. Um, you, you have to work so hard for it. And, you know, you know, for my business, I can only speak for myself. Like we own stakes and help build up startups myself as well as own a development company. And, you know, the reason like we have, you know, staff that are willing to leave their families and travel to the other side of the world to work in our development centers or, you know, move to different countries. Like, for instance, I was telling you about before this on this call, we're setting up in the U.S. We're opening an office in New York and Silicon Valley in about a month or two. Um, the reason people are like so committed is because they know how committed myself and my business partner, Josiah, are, as well as all the senior management team here, because, you know, it takes a certain level of commitment to pull this off. It's not like you throw it on the app store and it's done. I mean, if you look at some of these, you know, these big developers like Clash of the Clan, you see all these, you know, people making a hundred thousand dollars a day, fifty thousand dollars a day, these kind of big people, then they're not they're not amateurs here. They're actually running as businesses. They have marketing people, they build a team. They started just like you and I would have started, you know, one or two people, some friends building the company up. But but I mean as, as they got more and more into the business, they got more and more serious. They brought on the right people. So I think that, to be honest with you, the biggest challenge, and I think you tapped on it straight away with venture capital, is that they can smell straight away if you're committed. Mm. And, you know, they don't, in the early stages of business, it's very difficult to bet on the business because, you know, 
be honest with you, I hear really great ideas every week. I hear really, like, if someone could execute them, they would be game changer ideas. But the thing is, it's always about the people, and investors always bet on the people. Who are the people involved in your project? Are you the kind of guys that will refuse to get, guys or girls, I should say, who will refuse to give up? Are you the kind of people that are so committed to this that this is something that you're going to work on 80, 90 hours a week and just, you know, work like 100 Ten hundred thousand percent. You know, I think that I think that's what people like. That's what a savvy investor is trying to smell out in somebody, and and that's why I always say, you know, um, the first round, if you can get to MVP without bringing on external investors, if you can do that through bringing on friends and family as co-founders or shareholders, and, and you can have a little bit of flexibility without someone like that breathing down your neck, that's probably a good thing. I mean, obviously, maybe that's not the such circumstances a lot of people can do. Um, in that case, yeah, you got to go and find investors, but just be aware that it's just not free money. Like these guys will hold you accountable and you just can't just be like, oh, I'm too tired. I don't want to do the startup anymore. You know, it's not like that. Like once you take money, you're committed, man. Absolutely, Mark. Absolutely. So let me ask you the, the one question that I asked every guest we have on here on Preneurcast at the end of the conversation. And that yep. is, what's the one question I haven't asked you that I probably should have? Um, oh, wow. <laughs> That's a tough question. Um, I, to be honest with you, I think that... Um, the question that you really should ask, and, and this isn't really about app development as much, but it's about, um, you know, what it takes to actually be successful. And that's what I talked about before, what it takes to build a startup. Um, because, I mean, it goes so much further beyond monetization and app development. And, I mean, that's where you start off that. But if your app becomes successful and takes off, then it really becomes a matter of growing a startup. So I think it's like the question is, you know, what does it take to actually make this happen? Because that's not always like a pleasant thing to hear. Like a lot of people hear that and they're like, well, this isn't for me. Mm. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I think that, you know, a lot of people look at the outliers like, you know, Flappy Bird and think that I, if I, you know, create an app for 1200 bucks on Odesk, I can throw it up there and I might start making 50 grand a day. But yeah. when you really look at the science and the analytics behind it, it's, it's not how it is. These guys are seriously running serious businesses and, and treating it as such. So... Absolutely. Mark, mate, thank you very much for your time. It's been good to catch up. Been a lot of water under the bridge over the last four <laughs> or five years, mate. It so, has been. Uh, thank congratulations you so much for time, with Appster, mate. It's been awesome to sort of watch it from afar and, you know, 100, 100 employees you know, across a number of countries and going to the States, mate. We'll have to uh, get you back on Monday and actually chat about not about app development as such, but about what you did to actually grow the business so well, so rapidly. So, that'd be really keen to hear you know, how you grew the business, how you marketed it, how you deal with the, the headaches of, you know, managing 100 people and how you found great staff and great board members and and all that sort of stuff yeah i'd love to i'd love to speak about that thank you so much for having me so pete you know again you managed to get some great stuff out of mark there uh as you said at the beginning you know you framed it well that it was the two sides of it the the building of the apps and which great advice from somebody who does it all day every day and has made a business out of it but also the growing of the business i think it was it really came out really well that one cool no i appreciate it and uh Speaking of appreciation, everyone who sort of tweeted and emailed and, and hung out with us online in various places this week, we do really appreciate the love. Obviously, the, the show is free. We share this and, and invest our time for free, and we do appreciate everyone sort of you know paying us back, I guess, in uh, you know Twitter comments and social shares and app. Um, iTunes reviews. So, you know, if you do love the show, we would really appreciate it if you do sort of let us know in one form or the other. Obviously, with pretty much every uh, iPod, um, iPhone, you know, Android app that plays podcasts these days, you can click a button um, and leave a review or share something socially uh, really, really easily. So, if you can take a moment right now and, you know, grab the device you're listening to us on and just click that social share button and, you know, let everyone know that you listen to the show and that you enjoy the show and some of your biggest takeaways, it would, would mean the world to us to sort of uh, hear what you guys have to say about the show and, and, and what you enjoy about it and things like that. So, please keep in contact on all the social platforms and, and leave reviews and stuff. It does uh, mean a lot to us. Definitely. Folks, wherever you're listening to us, please do the, just press that feedback button. Um, you can also go to the website, preneurmarketing.com. The whole podcast library is there with all the show notes and links, transcripts of all the shows. You can download the files uh, or listen to them live on, on, the sh- on the page there. And there's comment boxes below each podcast episode you can leave us a comment there you can even leave us a little voice message if you've got a microphone on whatever you're you're visiting with um there's a little box on the side of the screen 
leave a voice message. So there's loads of ways to get back to us. We love your feedback, and we do really appreciate you folks being a part of the Preneur community. Absolutely. So, Pete, what are we doing next week? So next week, we're continuing on our uh, conversation uh, in the theme of the seven levers. We're going to be talking about, um, is it conversions or opt-ins? What's next week? I've actually gone blank. <laughs> we're going to do it. Well, hey, everything matters, and you can do it in any order, but we're going to go to opt-ins Beautiful. next week. Beautiful. So we're talking about opt-ins, about how to actually increase the opt-ins of your business, whether you're a retail store, whether you're a consultant and service provider like an accountant, maybe you're a tradesman, or obviously if you're an online-based business selling e-commerce-based products or information products, we're going to be covering the whole gamut of uh, increasing opt-ins and no doubt there'll be at least one thing you can go and actionably implement into your business after listening to next week's show to work towards that 10% increase goal, which is uh, the aim of the, the Seven Levers framework. That's right. We always try and make sure you've got something that you can take away from these shows and implement. Now, speaking of taking away and implementing, if you are new to the show, uh, first-time listener, welcome. Welcome to the show. But do check out Seven Levers Report. Dot com. You can download a free 39-page PDF which covers the Seven Levers Framework, which is the, the core framework that pretty much everything we do in our business projects, in the businesses I advise, that I invest in, that I own myself, uh, and also everybody who listens to the show, it's the framework that they, we all listen, listen to and work from when we're trying to grow our business, and it just covers the seven very easy uh, 10.38% increases that you need to work on that will double the profit of your business. So check out sevenleversreport.com. If you haven't already downloaded the report, uh, we really encourage you to do so because it's uh, really changing a lot of people's businesses all around the world. Okay, folks, thanks for listening. Thanks for joining us on the show this week, and we'll see you all next week. You've been enjoying another fine episode of PreneurCast with Pete Williams and Dom Gocher. Make sure to hang out with the boys online at www.preneurmarketing.com or drop them a line via PreneurCast at PreneurGroup.com.